Today it's my pleasure to chat with Tony Wiscori. He's a DH Chen Distinguished Professor of Neurology and Neurological Sciences at Stanford. He's also director of the Phil and Penny Knight Initiative for Brain Resilience at Stanford. And for any of you distance runner fans or running in general, um, Phil Knight was one of the co-founders of Nike. So I imagine Tony you're having some Nike money filtering in somehow to Stanford? Yeah. Hi, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, so we were really very fortunate to get this uh, tremendous gift um, from the Knight family. And um, I like to run, but I'm not sponsored by Nike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you, so you're from Switzerland originally, is that right? That's right. I got my uh, PhD in immunology uh, from the University of Bern. And then I was interested in um, studying the immune system in the brain. And it's interesting, immunologists have always used the brain to study the immune system with some of the, you know, basic discoveries made with models of multiple sclerosis or viral encephalitis. And so you I know, looked at different labs. You know, Tony, uh, I've, I've thought about this before from an evolutionary standpoint. Yeah. And you, you can talk. We've had previous podcasts on the immune system, but there's an innate immune system, which is essentially cells like macrophages that are already in the tissue. And then right. you have the humoral or innate where you've got white blood cells. And so organisms had nervous systems before they had humoral immune systems. Right. So I was always thought, well, you know, we're discovering immune signaling pathways in neurons, for example, whatever. Yeah. We've done some work on that. But maybe from an evolutionary standpoint, they're actually first functioning in nervous systems before they even had the humoral immune system. Yeah, that's entirely possible. Um, I think certainly the innate immune system the macrophage system is is something that you know is quite old and it, it's also possible that sort of the more specialized uh, adaptive immune response evolved from those lineages um, but that it borrowed from other cell types absolutely yeah and, yeah. and so you were trained as an immunologist a lot of hardcore studying what t cells and... Yeah, I actually studied a very interesting observation that I think still think is 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 puzzling. So T cells, when they get activated, they express um, so called MHC class two molecules, which allow them to display antigens to other cells, and it's a, a critical part of the immune tolerance that we have in our bodies, and. There are, you know, typically these macrophages are what we call professional antigen presenting cells. So their job is to collect all the different types of um, materials and proteins that the, an organism encounters and then show it to the immune cell and say, is this from my own body or is this something foreign that I should attack? And for whatever reason, the T cells, which are usually the attackers and the ones that control the immune, system, uh, immune response, when they get activated, they also have the capability to display these antigens. And so maybe this is a sort of a, um, a, a cycle that, that signals back to the immune system and shuts it off. So that's what my mm -hmm. study showed, you know, now, uh, what, 30 years ago almost, <laughs> that, um, that when antigens are presented by T cells, that actually reduces uh, the immune response and sort of shuts it down again. Yeah, but and, that's a long time ago. And then and, I, you know, I was interested in understanding the immune system in the brain and got initially joined Leonard Mucci's lab, uh, who was at the time studying HIV encephalitis. And so I got involved in that. And he also expressed some of the first cytokines in mouse models um, in the brain, in astrocytes. And so I got involved in that and studied immune responses in the brain. 
And he, he was already starting to work on Alzheimer's disease models too, right? So then Exactly. That was just a transition. When I joined his lab, I was a second postdoc. He started to work with uh, a, a company that had developed a mouse model for Alzheimer's disease, but needed help in really characterizing it. And so that's when he and his friend Eliezer Maslia got involved in it. And um, and then, you know, I, I wanted to know what's going on here. And because we expressed cytokines in the brain, it was it made sense for us to then see what if we cross two mice, one that overproduces a cytokine and has inflammation with this new model of Alzheimer's disease uh, that pro produces amyloid deposits and these so-called plaques. And um, that led to a lot of interesting yeah. observations. And that, and, that, yeah. that, that was uh, TGF beta, is that right? That's right, yeah. yeah. Which yeah, is, you what know, happened, you know, before we get to the young blood for old brains, which is yeah, we'll yeah. pretty quickly. Um, so what happened with that story? I mean, you, you did a lot of work that preclinical studies that had some implications for actually doing clinical trials in patients with Alzheimer's, right? Is that? Yeah, I mean, in that, with these models, not, not that much. I mean, the, what, what we found is that whatever you do to the immune system is somehow affecting um, neurodegeneration in the brain. So some of these uh, mediators, some of these cytokines, um, they would accelerate amyloid deposition and cause more inflammation. Others would reduce it. And what was very interesting with TGF-beta, which we know is sort of a double-faced uh, factor that can both initiate inflammation, but then also shut it down again and regulate it. Um, we saw indeed that it led to an activation of microglia in the brain, these the immune cells, the native immune cells in the brain, and actually cleared a lot of the amyloid in the brain, um, in, in the brain tissue, in the gray matter, but then it accumulated in the blood vessels as a response mm -hmm. to it. Um, and so we see a lot of sort of inflammatory uh, activation in blood vessels when we overexpress TGF beta, and that led then to accumulation of uh, amyloid in the vasculature. And it's interesting, people start to see this now. Christian Haas sees this with TREM2 variants, sort of a similar. And um, isn't some of the initial studies of uh, immunization and antibody, you know, amyloid antibodies for Alzheimer's patients, they would see the amyloid going down. Was there accumulation in vessels in those human patients too? Yeah, in some of them, and and also vascular, you know, vascular damage, and and some of these, um, you know, even edemas uh, that you got sort of um, injury in the vasculature. And we actually showed that um, at the time with active immunization that you can get uh, immune cells accumulating around the blood vessels, and you get infiltration of T cells. Um, so th there's clearly an immune component there that um, I think now well, people are starting it's to get complicated and very touchy. That's right. Okay, yeah. and then and then you then you got recruited to Stanford from your postdoc. Is that right? Yeah. So actually, Leonard was recruited, who was my you know oh, my yeah, boss right. at the that's time. Right. He was recruited to the Gladstone Institute right. um, to start. Um, sort of a neurological disease branch there. They had previously worked on an immunological institute focused on HIV, cardiovascular, um, and with the discovery of APOE sort of um, being a risk factor for the brain, um, they started this neurological institute, recruited Leonard, and I moved with him to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. I was there for a few free, few years before I ended up at, at uh, Stanford, yeah. yeah. And then, then you bumped bumped into Tom Randall. That's right. Yeah, so what, tell yeah. that story. That and that was that that, that was sort of a, a, a really a wonderful uh, opportunity, and you know, one of these random things that happen in life, right? Um, Tom actually recruited me to Stanford. Um, he he was the chief um, 
of neurology at the VA and uh, and recruited me to the VA. So I had an affiliation at Stanford, but my laboratory was at the VA hospital, which is very close to Stanford. And um, we started to work together. Um, I mean, he's a wonderful mentor and, and uh, made this really intriguing observation um, that muscle stem cells can be rejuvenated uh, by exposure to a young circulatory environment. And just to put this a little bit more in context, so um, what, uh, what probably many of the listeners know is that we, with aging, the scientists have observed that many of the stem cells sort of start to function less uh, well and they don't produce progeny, they don't regenerate the tissues as well. And so Tom's interest was muscle stem cells. And it's well known there that if you injure, for example, an old muscle, it doesn't actually regenerate that muscle tissue like it does in a young organism, but it produces a lot of fibrotic tissue. And Tom had a very simple question. Is this because the stem cell in itself can no longer produce new uh, muscle tissue? Or is it something from the environment that is responsible for that? So is the stem cell missing some factors from the environment that make us make it basically an old stem cell? And that's where he used this uh, model, uh, which is somewhat creepy. It's called parabiosis. And it was actually invented over 100 years ago by Paul Baer in France. Um, and Essentially, it is a surgical model where two animals are search, uh, sutured together at their flanks, typically. So you open their skin and then you suture them together. And this model was used in the past to understand tissue rejection, transplantation. It made, you know, seminal discoveries came out of this model. Um, even um, viruses that can induce um, sarcomas, for example, Rouse used this to show that the Rouse sarcoma virus can go from one animal to another. Um, and it was essential for the understanding of sex hormones, for example, in the 50s and 60s. And, and, um, but a, Tom, discovery, and the discovery of leptin too, right? And leptin as well. Yeah, thanks yeah. for reminding me. So that's an, a hormone that regulate sort of satiety and and has a very important role in in uh in obesity and people were able to show that this factor can go from one animal to another yeah. and make it obese exactly um so tom used this model uh in a way that he put a young mouse together with an old mouse and so he could ask the question would factors from the blood of the young mouse help regenerate the old muscle and that was indeed the case and uh mike and irina convoy were uh, postdocs at the time in his lab and and did these early studies they have now their own lab at uc berkeley and have continued to work in this field um, what they also observed is that um, the liver benefited from it and they saw that there were was more proliferation or cell division in the brain, but they didn't really follow up on this. And this is where Tom and I then started to collaborate and, um, and, and explore, there, you know, what happens in the brain. In the initial study, did they do any, any blood transfusion or not? No, they didn't. They didn't. No, they, no. they, no, they sutured the mice together and, and used that uh, model basically uh, for their studies. And then they moved on to study more the stem cells. They also didn't really pursue what factors might be re responsible for that at the time. I came sort of into this also with my experience in with the immune system in the brain. I got a bit discouraged that, as I mentioned before, that whatever we did to the immune system somehow affected um, you know, the pathology in these mice and made them either better or, or worse. But it didn't really advance our knowledge sufficiently, I think, to translate to humans. And so I was very interested in um, 
finding a way to study humans um, and study them at the molecular level. And that's, of course, extremely difficult in living people if you want to understand their brain. So we can, you know, do cognitive testing, we can do all kinds of imaging, but you can't get a piece of tissue from the brain of a living person. Mm -hmm. But what we can do is we can get either cerebrospinal fluid. So this is the liquid that bases our brains and, and that fills the ventricles, or we can get blood. And so I started to look at the possibility that we could measure the composition of the blood and uh, learn about the disease. And this is, of course, something that, you know, in clinical medicine, we've done all along. We've, if you go to the doctor, you give a sample of blood and they measure a few proteins and they say, oh, your heart is, is sick or, you know, your liver is not functioning. And increasingly, people started to explore the possibility, can you find something that tells you the brain is not okay? Uh, but it was, was always from a pathological perspective. Is something wrong with it, right? But with uh, advances in measuring many proteins, what is called proteomics, um, people started to measure hundreds or even thousands of proteins. And that offered started to offer the possibility that you could look at how these proteins change in composition in the blood with age, for example, or with disease. And so we had this observation that there were quite pronounced changes in the composition of the blood with age. And um, then the question is, of course, is that a response to the aging process? So do we see a changes occur because the tissues get older? Or are these changes actually driving even part of the aging process? So could it be that the changes that we see from a young to an older person, that they're actually responsible for some parts of the aging process? And so Tom had this ideal model to test this question because he had a young mouse paired with an old mouse and the blood was exchanged. So basically young blood can go into the old mouse and old blood can go into the young mouse. And so we, as I said before, we followed up on the observation that Tom had uh, that there was more cell division in the brain. Um, and also with the motivation that we knew that there are changes occurring in the blood with aging. And so when we then looked at this more carefully, and this was a graduate student I had um, at the time, Saul Vileda, who has now his own lab at UCSF, who, who dared to basically suture these mice together and look at their brains. And he discovered indeed that um, there are more, um, stem cells that start to divide in a very specific region of the brain that we use to form new memories and retrieve memories. It's called the hippocampus. And um, he also found that there was less inflammation in these brains. Mm -hmm. And there was overall sort of the mice just looked better. The old mice looked better when he did this, you know, suture them together. But we quickly thought that we, in order to, to really take this apart and understand it more at the molecular level, we need to have some way of dissociating this complex, you know, model of suturing mice together, which is, of course, no, you know, beyond yeah. any you know, physiological. We this, you know, we did all this work with intermittent fasting, right? That's and, right. Yeah. And, yeah. and so... I had a I had a really good surgeon, you know, animal surgeon in the lab, and he made so the idea was we're going to feed one he, one animal in the parabiotic pair every other day, and mm -hmm. then the other one could eat every day, and yeah. oh, you know, wow. we you know, <laughs> but he had a lot of trouble with. It was easier actually in rats for him and in, in mice. He was finding some of them. Well, this gets kind of, mm -hmm. you know, the sutures started to pull apart, mm -hmm. and so yeah, yeah, they had a. Um, but but anyway, 
so and then uh, there's this compounding factor you've got these two animals physically together they're kind of not only their blood exchange but there's other things going on they're interacting mm -hmm. you know with each other and mm -hmm. you know how do you control stress so that's right you know the transfusion takes all of that out of the equation potential compound right yeah yeah no that was our thinking yeah. i mean the, the advantage of the parabiosis model is that you have continuous exchange but it uh, has yeah, it has right. the disadvantage as you mentioned of um you know being completely unphysiological of course um and that you have potentially two animals that you know socially don't are not compatible don't interact or even want to fight now it's not really possible for them the way if you do the surgery the, the right way and um but so i think we could we could manage that but i think there are different results in different labs depending on how the surgeries are done and how well the mice are connected and whether they can yeah. injure themselves and things like that yeah but um, what Saul also observed, and, and I think he was the first really to look at this or report it, is that the young mouse actually suffered from the exposure to the old. Yeah. And so he, he saw the exact opposite effect. So he saw an even more pronounced effect on these stem cells in the brain. So there's a, a, a strong reduction in the number of stem cells in the young mouse that got the old blood there was more inflammation and um, sort of generally if we looked at other parameters of you know brain physiological brain health it looked like they they were injured they were they looked almost older if you compared it on sort of an, a lifespan axis and that prompted us then to um, explore the possibility that we could simply collect blood from one animal and then repeatedly infuse it into the other animal. Now, it, it sounds in hindsight, it sounds trivial, but, you know, a lot of people said, oh, this will never work because you can't give us much blood um, and it will have no effect. How many times do you want to do this? um and you know how much are you going to infuse we, we're not allowed to infuse more than um 10 percent of the total blood volume per infusion so how are you going to solve that problem and so we just came up with something um we asked ourselves so when people um get infusions um how how much that do they usually get and you know, it's it's in a range, I think, of five to ten percent of the blood volume actually is something that I think is clinically relevant. And so that's what we tried. And we did this every three days for three weeks. We just picked something and said, let's see. Mm -hmm. And we saw indeed very similar effect that we got with the parabiosis model. And again, in both directions. So we saw that the old mice benefited from young blood and the, the young mice sort of were injured or uh, had you know, damaging effects from, from the, the old blood. And um, what we also uh, found is that we don't need the cells in the blood. It's really the liquid part, which is called plasma. So we... We collect the blood, we get rid of the cells, and then we're left with the liquid portion, sort of a yellowish fluid. And that's also what, in the clinical setting, what often uh, patients receive if they lose blood or for other purposes, they get, they get um, plasma. Or they get even fractions of plasma. We can talk about that a little bit more, maybe, um, sort of as a clinical translation. But this model of infusing plasma really allowed us to then um, start to do biochemistry or at least start to think about doing biochemistry and see, you know, what parts of this blood uh, are responsible for it. And also, that turned also out to be you can, extreme. You yeah, can also right. do behavior. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, thanks for reminding me. So. Yeah. 
in the in the parabiosis model you can't really do behavior and mm -hmm. so that was really one of the um main advantages of infusing plasma is that we could now test whether mice would learn better again whether they um in in different learning paradigms whether they remember you know uh, how do they get out of a, a pool of water and things like that and indeed what we found in multiple tests these um old mice uh, really benefited from young plasma yeah yeah and and also you look you saw you actually did somebody there did electrophysiology <laughs> too right Actually, That's right. recording yeah. synaptic transmission in the hippocampus. Yes, yeah. So we we collaborated with with uh, with a, la a lab that uh, was able to um, do electrophysiology in slices from this hippocampus and could show that the um, the neurons communicated better again with each other and um, and again restored sort of a more useful. Uh, state in in these old brains, and what we could also show is um, uh, using a trick where we used an immunodeficient mouse, we could actually infuse them with young human plasma, and show that hmm. human plasma has the capacity to rejuvenate an old mouse brain. So, showing basically that there are similar factors present in humans uh, that are beneficial. Was there a quantitatively any greater beneficial effect with the human serum, or, or did could you really? Yeah, it's a bit. Yeah, it's it's hard to get quantitative results, right? Because you're really really looking at very different um, sort of uh, composition of. We actually used cord plasma, so the youngest human plasma we could get our hands oh. on. Oh yeah. Um, and that was very different in composition in protein composition, even from just adult human blood, but then also from from mouse uh, blood. But still, there are a lot of growth factors in and other proteins that are highly conserved between mice and humans so that you get this rejuvenating effect. You know, one interesting uh, molecule in blood that's very different levels in humans and rodents is uric acid. I didn't it's, know that. Yeah, That's... it's you know, so that mice have an enzyme uricase mm -hmm. that gets rid of uric acid, and somewhere in primate evolution, actually also in bird evolution and bat evolution, interestingly, there's a mutation in this uricase gene, and, th and that's why humans get can get gout, mm -hmm. right? And so it turns out. The uric acid is the in humans is the major antioxidant molecule. It it directly scavenges hydroxyl radical. And anyway, I just yeah, I'd throw that out. Yeah, no, that's I made, I just made a note. I have to look up uh, uricase, and so it's also in plasma. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So we have to look at that in our uh, proteomic data sets. <laughs> And see how it changes with with age and disease. Well, it, it's 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 a small molecule. It's actually structurally very similar to caffeine. Mm -hmm. You know, in the ring structure. Yeah. So you'd have you'd have to. Um, how did we measure it? I can't remember how we measured. Probably it. mass spectrometry. Mass spectrometry yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, but anyway, so you find this youthful blood uh, plasma, whether it's from a young mouse. Or a very young human, mm -hmm. you know, developing human, is beneficial for the brains of the older animals. It helps uh, restore their cognitive function. It it promotes the proliferation of the stem cells, and it seems to enhance the synaptic connections. Okay, so now you're trying to figure out: is there something in the young young blood? Is there one yeah. factor, or is it like what is it? Yeah. What is it? What is the golden nugget in there that uh, that might be responsible for it? And the answer is, there is not a single. There's not a single factor. Um, it's incredibly complex. And 
you know, initially people thought, oh, you know, we, we will find a factor. And, and, you know, there were a few studies that showed, oh, this factor, you know, is maybe the responsible factor for it. And, and I think most of these, um, it was typically proteins um, that were either beneficial or detrimental. They do have an effect. And they do have an effect on some tissues more so than on others and more mm -hmm. some cells, but not on others. And, um, and so we, we really still don't have an answer. What are the key factors that are responsible for these effects and how we, could we potentially translate them to humans? And again, the, the, I think it's clearly accepted now in the field by most people that there are multiple factors that have beneficial effects, but also factors that have detrimental effects that accumulate with age. So therapeutically, you could think that inhibiting some of the bad factors might be equally beneficial to giving a good factor. Yeah. And the best will probably be a combination. And, you know, nature made this cocktail we call yeah. plasma over millions or, you know, evolutionary development. Um, and it will be challenging probably to imitate that. And we cannot make it synthetically with technologies that exist today at scale, right? Yeah. So we have to figure out what are the key components and then those we can make synthetically, but um, we have also no regulatory pathway um, to approve, let's say 10 different factors as one cocktail. So. We would have to figure out how well, you could do, we even you, test that. To approve plasma, you definitely do it. Yes, yeah. And so that could be a way to do it where you would say, because plasma is a natural product, what we will do is we will make individual components synthetically, but then we put them in the same ratio as they exist in humans. Oh. Maybe yeah. that... That's yeah. something one could convince the FDA, but right. I don't know. So, so it's a young, different discussion. <laughs> the young blood is good for the old brains in many ways. It's not clear. It's pretty clear it's not just one molecule. Mm -hmm. And then now, you know, as you know, in at least in laboratory animals, and it looks like in maybe non-human primates, the one powerful way to kind of slow down aging is caloric restriction or intermittent fasting. And in humans, particularly exercise is beneficial. And so you did some work on, so, so that, that's obviously a whole bunch yeah. more experiments, right? Take mm -hmm. blood from yeah. calorie restricted or mm -hmm. exercise. You want yeah. to talk about that? Yeah. Be before we go there, if I may just add one more uh, sort of important piece that um, was enabled by technological advances, and this is called single cell RNA sequencing. Mm -hmm. So what that allows scientists to do is to take an individual cell out of an organism and measure all the genes that are expressed in the cell. So it gives us basically a profile of what the cell is doing and also how it's responding to its environment. And so over the past you know, five or 10 years, these technologies have become more and more sophisticated and reliable. And so we applied this to normal aging in the mice. So we looked at hundreds of different um, or, or over a hundred different cell types throughout the body and measured how they how the composition of genes, how expression of genes changes with age. And then we looked in this parabiosis model. We looked in mice that were paired with old mice. And uh, so young mice paired with old mice and old mice paired with young mice. And again, at the single cell level. And so what we could see is, so if you think about let's say you have a, a given gene that increases as you get older in a cell. So if we take now the same cell from an old mouse that got young blood, we can look whether the yeah. cell now looks younger, right? Based yeah. on expression of this gene. And so you can do this over and over for thousands of cells through all different tissues. Um, and what we see is that there are indeed most cells respond to exposure to young blood or old blood. 
their composition of the gene signature changes, many of them look younger in the old exposed to young, and many look older when you look in old mice that get exposed to young blood. So we can basically prove at the molecular level on a large scale throughout the organism what we sort of observed at the functional level and with relatively crude tools really pans out to be true at, at the molecular level, at the single cell level. And there's now multiple papers from different labs that came out that basically keep confirming these findings. And then you can ask, what are these genes doing? What do we know about them? And, you know, one of the top pathways again in two papers that now just came out is mitochondrial metabolism uh, oxidative um sort of atp synthesis and uh, uh you know respiration so yeah. mitochondria seem to be one of the key pathways that not only change with aging their function goes down with age but we can actually rejuvenate them with uh exposure to young plasma um which is, you know, fascinating. Yeah. And that a, ties in then to, you know, caloric restriction, of course. Yeah. And, we, we did and a metabolism. lot of work on mitochondria over the exactly. years. Exactly. Yeah. Most recently on a protein deacetylase CERT3. Yeah. But, yeah. So, I mean, as you know, in the Alzheimer's field, it's been, in, in general, in the neurodegenerative disorder field, Parkinson's, actually it's Parkinson's, the evidence is, extremely compelling from both genetic and experimental studies that there's a problem with mitochondrial function mm -hmm. and, and a problem in getting rid of mitochondria that are not functioning well and then right. they're they're yeah. accumulating and mm -hmm. then you're getting more free radicals produced and mm -hmm. so on so that's pretty interesting so then the question is you know but that intuitively, you, you, there must be some signaling pathway, some some molecules that are binding to a receptor on a cell That's and, right. and yeah. activating those genes. That's right. So yeah. then you're still back to the question of what, what, what about, is that? Yeah, kind of upstream of mitochondria. Exactly, yeah. And, and I think this is it's sort of an evolution of this approach, right? Initially, people thought they can just look at a few molecules that change in the composition of the blood and then pick one and they may be lucky and have the, you know, the key factor. But I think this approach of looking, how does the tissue actually respond? How do cells respond to these rejuvenating effects? And then not just to young plasma, but look at how do they respond to caloric restriction? Yes. How do they, do they respond to exercise? And then look at all these interventions that we know are functionally beneficial and ask, what are the common pathways? Are there any common pathways? Probably there are. Um, maybe there are different pathways. Maybe exercise also has a benefit on some other pathway. Yeah. and would actually be complementary to right. let's say young plasma or caloric restriction but then you might find some pathways that are targeted by all these interventions and so i think in the next few years we will see these studies that really start to put everything together and then if it turns out to still be the case that mitochondria are one of the key um targets that we need to fix if you will um, to you know slow down the aging process or even reverse it to fight these age-related diseases then um uh yeah we should actually we should absolutely try to understand how it works i mean we, we're already in our lab we're already trying to set up screens that look for the factors that make mitochondria function better but they're not trivial to do because you know, any screen in vivo is incredibly difficult. And as soon as you take it into a culture dish, then you don't know how relevant it's going to be. So, but yeah, yeah. stay tuned. We hope in the next few years we'll fish out a few factors that are responsible for this mitochondrial 
uh, rejuvenation. So, you know, Leonard Hayflick, you know, the Hayflick hypothesis, obviously. Yeah. And so he, he showed that if you take skin cells, fibroblasts from animals of different ages, the number of times they can divide in culture diminishes as age increases. Mm -hmm. So is, is your cell culture screen going to be you take like old fibroblasts from old individuals and then expose them to young? Or... Yeah, that's probably what we're going to do. Yeah. And then try to put CRISPR libraries in there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You can yeah. make things go much quicker with CRISPR. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good. And then we can differentiate uh, the fibroblasts into different cell types through direct trans differentiation so that we have, for example, old neurons. Um, and increasingly, people are trying to do this for other cell types. And you can use human human cells. That's in right. Yeah, and, and human, absolutely. Human we want to work with human with human uh, tissues. Yeah. yeah. And you should get some blood from human CR, you know, calorie restriction or intermittent fasting studies and from that could be very interesting or from, from your runners, your cross country yeah. runners. That's Stanford, right. Yeah. Yeah. Who are actually pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> are they? Yeah, they know. are. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I used to coach high school cross country and I ran a lot. So great. I can yeah. Keep, keep yeah. Up I love that. running too. But yeah, I can't run that long anymore. My back is not too good. Yeah. Well, yeah. I have a lot of issues too as I get older. Um, all right, so let me scroll down here. Let's let's so talk about a, a. You asked me actually. Sorry, you asked me about the exercise. Um, should I talk yeah, about yeah, yeah. that quickly? Yeah. 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 So if you think about this concept of you can take the blood from a young organism and put it in an old and have it benefit, we know that caloric restriction diets are beneficial. We know exercise is beneficial. So an obvious question to us was, um, is the blood composition in an animal that exercises, is that better, that blood is that more beneficial? Does that provide benefits to the organism? And could we take that blood and put it into um, a mouse that mm -hmm. does not exercise? Mm -hmm. And so just for context, people have shown with respect to the brain that um, uh, uh, studies from Rusty Gage at the Salk uh, many years ago that if mice run on a running wheel, um, they actually make more of these new neurons in the hippocampus and they yeah, become you know, smarter. You know, Henriette von Prague, who actually did that work when she was with Rusty, she, we recruited her as a as a tenor track investigator at NIH and yeah. she followed up on that and and what did she she did some work with that suggested a lysosomal protein cathepsin mm -hmm. B yeah might play a role which I, I could never kind of figure what but how, how it would work yeah how yeah. it would work yeah 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 and it could be part of a you know a downstream response absolutely but so our our thinking was that um there must be some uh there might there must be a way to test whether this is you know a blood factor that is responsible for these effects or um is it something that is more centrally regulated that you know just the fact that the organism knows they're running that that provides sort of a yeah. you know yeah. A benefit that happens actually in your brain a sort of a reward circuit of some sort um, and probably both might be true um, but what we did is we, we just took mice uh, we took young mice and we half of them got a running wheel that was actually running and half got a running wheel that was blocked and so then we collected the blood from the ones who were from both groups and injected it into mice uh, that you know were just in a normal cage and never ran. And what we found is that the, the blood and again the liquid fraction, the plasma from the exercise mice, induced this neurogenesis and improved cognitive function in the mice, almost like if they would run themselves. And um, and the plasma from the control group didn't do anything. 
um, didn't as change. As far the as effect. brain intrinsic mechanisms, as you know, there's a lot of work pointing to BDNF, brain derived neurotrophic factor, as one important player in the effects of exercise. And it it definitely is a if you if you measure BDNF mm -hmm. levels in the brains of your runner mice, mm -hmm. it will be it higher. goes up. Yeah, yeah. But then th does plasma BDNF levels go up? Do you know? With we, we didn't see significant effects there, okay. but it could be that some of the factors that are produced in the blood will induce BDNF production in the brain. Yeah. Um, that's, of course, also possible. So in parallel and without knowing of each other, my former trainee, Saul, did similar experiments, but he did it in old mice. And so he... <laughs> he could also show the same effect that you know the plasma from exercise mice had a benefit um, so you you forgot about him when he left well we tried not to you know compete with each other or <laughs> or talk to each other too much about the experiments we do <laughs> to, to sort of give him independence no more we were good friends um yeah yeah no no but, i know that's yeah, yeah yeah um but uh well, anyway, great minds think alike, so. You could say that maybe, yeah. <laughs> but what, what's interesting about both studies is that when we looked for potential factors and we compared the composition of, of this plasma from exercise with non-exercise mice, um, we honed in on a factor that um, is part of an inflammatory cascade. It's called the complement cascade, as, as well as the coagulation cascades. And it's produced mostly in the liver. It's called clustering or APOJ. Mm -hmm. And Saul found a factor through, again, through um, proteomic studies. And his factor was also produced in the liver. So what seems to be the case, and it's a different factor, it's called GLBDH, uh, GLPH. And what's interesting is that what seems to happen is that the muscle induces the liver to produce something that then goes to the brain and has these beneficial effects. Did you publish I, that already? The cluster? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Because that's, as you know, there's been some link to Alzheimer's disease. Too. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. it's a very intriguing link. The, the, the challenge, of course, with translating clustering into a medicine is that it's so highly abundant in plasma. Mm. Um, that you could not dose it at high enough levels, right? Mm. It's you would have to administer grams of that of that mm. um, protein to have an effect, which was actually a challenge for us, even in mice, to give them so much protein. Um, it was very expensive. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And what about? Okay, so you know, it's kind of my general working hypothesis is kind of overall for kind of how to optimize health in general and brain health is subject yourself to intermittent bioenergetic challenges mm -hmm. and and the intermittent aspect is important so exercise obviously right exercise mm -hmm. but then you need rest sleep mm -hmm. and then fasting recovery so during exercise, it's certainly stress on your muscle cells, and it's probably kind of a general systemic stress. And caloric restriction is a stress. In fact, cortisol levels go up, mm -hmm. which was kind of a paradox in the aging field for a long time that these animals are living a lot longer when they're on calorie restriction. But this stress hormone cortisol, which it's generally considered like a bad, to, it's bad to have mm -hmm. high yeah. cortisol levels. So we actually discovered the way cells respond to cortisol is different with intermittent fasting and chronic uncontrollable stress. So, oh, so I'm, that's I'm getting a little, yeah, little yeah. off the subject, but yeah. so there's two, two receptors, different types of receptors to which cortisol binds in cells. They're both transcription factors that affect gene expression. One is called the glucocorticoid receptor, GR, and the other is mineralocorticoid receptor, MR. Mm -hmm. With bad stress, you know, the kind of stress we experience during COVID or things that are uncontrollable and chronic, levels of MR go down and GR go up. 
we found it was exactly the opposite with intermittent fasting. GR goes down, MR goes up. So that's that, really interesting. And, and that, that kind of got buried in the literature, actually. Well, it was a long time ago, a graduate student in, when I was at Kentucky still. Uh, but anyway, so what I was getting to is what about the possibility that you, in general, the good things in the young blood and exercise blood and maybe caloric restriction blood. Actually, Rafa de Cabo, this is quite a while ago, he did he didn't follow up on this much, but he just took what do you do? It cultured some kind of cultured human cell line, and then he took human uh serum from either cal every other day calorie restriction or something and control mm -hmm. and and then he exposed and looked at gene expression in the cultured cells and the genes he found were actually stress responsive genes like heat shock proteins and um um what the heck i can't even i mean this is a long time rafa was he was actually in my laboratory as a postdoc oh i didn't know that well, well, with Don Ingram, so I was lab yeah. chief, uh -huh. and Don Ingram was under me and Rafa. Anyway, Rafa was a postdoc in laboratory in neurosciences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was ahead of, and then we kept him on it. And I, uh, I can't remember the other ones, but what, what about this idea of like in general, anti-aging things are things that. Well, it makes sense, right? Help cells re resist yeah. stress. But to induce those mm -hmm. things, you have to, in to induce a stress, cell stress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, this is a really interesting concept. And it is sort of counterintuitive, but it it is, it is it's what seems to underlie these benefits. Yeah. And, you know, what's also interesting, if you think about it, when does an organism's brain have to be at its best um, and that its highest cognitive ability is when it has no food yeah. right that's because that's, chap that's chapter one in my yeah book. yeah <laughs> i haven't read it <laughs> but um it that, that's really interesting right that yeah. um you you don't the brain is not functioning best when you give it too much food because no, you're <laughs> then you're sleepy. Yeah. Um, so it's it's actually functioning better when it's slightly starved, mm -hmm. which which is really interesting. Um, and then how does that translate to you know resilience to age related diseases mm -hmm. to you know cognitive decline and neurodegeneration or even to longevity? I think we, we, we don't know yet, um, but these are very interesting concepts. Yeah. So kind of the idea is during the challenge period, exercise or fasting pathways are activated to put the cell in kind of a stress resistance, conserve resources mode. Conserve resources, M4 yeah. goes down, right? Protein mm -hmm. synthesis goes mm -hmm. down, autophagy, get stimulated, mm -hmm. recycle things. And then re recovery period, resting, eating, sleeping, the cells can go into a growth and plasticity mode. Protein synthesis goes up. Uh, you know, they they clear out, they've cleared out the damaged molecules, maybe dysfunctional mitochondria, and you get mitochondrial biogenesis. So they're cycling mm -hmm. back and forth. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, I had one other thing that, you know, I was trying to things just keep popping into our minds, right, as we talk. Um, so insulin resistance is bad, right? So obesity, people with obesity, animals tend to have insulin resistance. It's, it's the yeah. main thing that happens in diabetes. It's bad for the brain with a lot of evidence for that now. There's such a thing as leptin resistance. And uh, so I think during aging, you know, there's impaired signaling for a lot of these pathways. So 
whatever, if we assume there's some molecules in the young blood, you know, that are activating signaling pathways, those signaling pathways must still be functional somehow. And um, I'm wondering how did how did how would you get it dissecting this out? You know, there's there's certain knockout mice where different you can knock out different genes, right? And then are you going to use CRISPR to knock out? I mean, you can like like kind of knock out a lot of different genes in the culture system, right? And then and then see. It's just like which a, genes are necessary gene? for a rejuvenating effect. Yeah, exactly. That's what. Or which genes are necessary yeah. for a detrimental effect. Yeah. And that can lead you then to the factor. So if yeah. you if you knock out the receptor, um, you know, if you knock out the, the MRGR and we see the effect goes away, then you know we know that it's must be something related to cortisol at least in that pathway right so it's not it's not always straightforward um and you know you need to then you know, obviously follow up with additional experiments but it's, it's a really good plan but it's a good yeah, yeah it makes yeah, a lot of a sense good, uh, mm -hmm, yeah and yeah. then before we finish up talk about so there was a a human study in spain and i don't that's the one I know about. Mm -hmm. And so they took, essentially, they're following up on the animal work that you and, and, and others have contributed to. And so describe that, that kind of initial study in Spain, which yielded yeah, some, yeah. some promising results. Yeah, so... I actually can't take credit for that study. It's 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 interesting how it came about. So yeah. in the Alzheimer's field, there was this notion that the amyloid that accumulates in the brain ends up in the blood and yeah. that the blood is sort of like a sink. Oh, and it yeah. was called the peripheral sink hypothesis. Yeah. And so the idea was if you would basically filter out all that a beta that is in the blood and mm. comes from the brain you oh, would get more a beta getting into the blood and so you could oh. sort of uh, filter it out so their idea was what if we just remove the the blood from a patient with alzheimer's disease and uh just re resupply it with um you know with plasma that we have in store Will that be beneficial? Um, so that was the, you know, sort of the initial thinking. And then when we did our studies, um, we actually started a company and the Spanish company, which is called Griffles, invested in our company and oh. they were interested in understanding how would this work. And what we quickly realized is what they actually give back to patients, they call it albumin. But it's a fraction from a process where you take plasma donations from thousands of donors and then use um, a filtration process. Um, it's called Cohen's fractionation. You get all these different fractions of the blood that have are enriched in different proteins. And one has, you know, they purify to 99% albumin, hmm. which is the most abundant protein in plasma but it still has hundreds of other proteins in there. And albumin is actually a carrier for growth factors. So it contains a lot of growth factors. And because the average donor is 35 years of age in their uh, plasma they produce, it's essentially young plasma. So what they did is they remove in their patients, they remove the old plasma through this machine, it's called apheresis, where basically your blood goes into a little centrifuge, cells go back to you, and the liquid gets removed. And then they give these oh, that, patients- That's what they do for kidney people with kidney? It's very similar, yeah. In kidney, yeah. Do, you do dialysis this dialysis. way, right? Where you take out uh, yeah. small molecules through a filter. Mm. Here you take out the cells, the blood cells, and you give them back to the patient. 
Oh, okay. So um, you don't okay. lose, you know, you don't want to lose the blood cells. No. That would be bad for an old okay. person. But they do this multiple times so that after a while, maybe 80% of your liquid fraction is replaced oh. and you get albumin back from young people, which is enriched with lots of growth factors. So they basically do a parabiosis type of experiment, right? Um, and they also give their patients uh, antibodies because you want to make sure that you didn't deplete too much of the antibodies. That's an IVIG ah, fraction. It's yeah, called yeah, yeah. clinically. And this is also something that, you know, patients with uh, bone marrow transplants will get or anybody with an autoimmune disease. It's another sort of there, magical there were, plasma fraction. I was, I'm from Rochester, Minnesota. I went to Mayo High School. Yeah, and yeah. So I'm, so I'm good friends with Ron Peterson. I don't know if you've ever come across yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. And my father had, uh, it turned out not to be AD, you know, but Ron diagnosed him with probable AD and then at autopsy, it was more like hippocampal sclerosis. But anyway, so... I was up there one time, this is a long time ago when my father was still alive. And I think they were starting trials of IVIG and Alzheimer's patients. And then I looked and they kind of didn't really help the cognition. So mm -hmm. that's right. So that, okay, so finish up on this yeah. study. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So what they found is, and um, this was actually in 500 individuals, placebo controlled. Um, so some patients got, you know, albumin infused and others didn't, and they sort of coded it so that people wouldn't know. Um, and they saw, they had two different doses. And in one of the doses, they saw uh, clear clinical benefits um, and, you know, patients improved in cognition yeah. and also in daily function of living. Um, and, uh, you know, overall a positive outcome, statistically significant positive outcome, but only in one of the doses. And so some people criticized it a bit. And it was, of, of course, a complex, um, you know, paradigm to remove plasma and then to give albumin plus this IVIG. Um, but I think what it shows is that there is clearly potential that this might work. And our company that we started together with uh, Griffles together also ran some phase one and uh, uh, phase two uh, studies in Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease, small studies, but they too show sort of positive signs that, you know, there, there could be benefit and also when we look at the changes in the composition of the plasma in the people who were treated, it looks like you actually do induce changes um, that are, um, you know, promising and sort of consistent with inducing a younger effect. The Convoys also had a study, a very small study that they just published last year, where they call it um, total plasma exchange. And in their title, it says something about plasma dilution, but they it essentially copy, when you look at it, they copy the protocol that Griffles use. So they remove plasma and they give albumin. Um, again, they write only we gave albumin, but albumin is not just one protein, it's a fraction. And it's from young individuals because you cannot buy albumin from old people. They simply don't, are not the donors uh, in these uh, companies who make albumin. Um, and have you and they also gave IVIG. Yeah, but, you know, there were multiple trials of IVIG. So it's this kind of simple minded thinking is pointing you in the direction of something bound to the albumin. Have you done proteomics on the albumin? These we did, yes. And we see there's lots and lots of proteins in there. And many of them, as I said, growth factors. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the challenge, you know, so just to go back to the very initial discussion about what are the factors. So when we had these initial findings that there's something in plasma that is beneficial, of course, what we did first is fractionation 
we bought these gigantic columns and loaded them with oh. tons of human plasma and tried to fractionate the plasma. But what we ended up with is albumin in every fraction because it's so abundant um, that it's just mm -hmm. very hard to, you know, get a good fractionation out of it. And then, of course, you need enough to then test these fraction and in mice again, right? So you, it has to be in a preparative way, yeah. which is incredibly complicated. And so we had to give up. It just didn't work. We could not get pure fractions that were significantly different from the next fraction. It yeah. was a wash, right? Everywhere is was sort of all the protein peaks were very flat. Do you have a few more minutes, Tony? Yeah, yeah. Okay, because yeah, you know, exosomes or extracellular vesicles. Um, so at NIA, so Dimitros Kapagianis was in my group too, and he's done quite a bit of work on. So all cells release these small membrane mm -hmm. vesicles. Yeah. They're very small. They're like- Fascinating. What, what are they? One ten thousandths of a millimeter or mm -hmm. yeah, hundred nanometer. Yeah. And, and these things, I think they were initially studied by people in the cancer field and- That's right, um, yeah. Because the molecular fingerprints in these vesicles released from cancer cells are often different than normal cells. Mm -hmm. So they were, they kind of coined the term liquid biopsy. That's right. And, and then Dimitrios and, and his collaborators found they could use an antibody against a neuron specific protein, uh, L1, and then first isolate the total pool of these vesicles in plasma and pull out the ones that are probably coming mainly from neurons and then integrate mm -hmm. them. So does this album and fraction have these vesicles in it? Do you know that? It's yeah, I, I'm glad you, you touch upon that, that, the exosomes. This is a very fascinating field. And, um, you know, the, when we measure proteins in plasma, um, all the assays that people use, they have detergent in there. And so we basically pop open all these vesicles, right? Yeah. We also look at lipoprotein particles. These are, yeah. you know, lipid rich um, droplets basically that have all kinds of proteins in there. I mean, they have, you know, the traditional APOE and or APOB in there, but they also have lots of other proteins that are, you know, simply proteins that love you know, lipids, they will just stick to these droplets. And so I think, um, you know, using these tools to uh, separate either where the exosomes come from, people have also shown their microRNAs in these yeah. um, exosomes that are almost like zip codes, uh, you know, where, where do they come from? Um, but what you can also do, and that's what we did recently, which is a little bit less uh, sophisticated, you can ask, are there proteins in plasma that originate from a given tissue because they're not expressed elsewhere? Right. And so out of 5,000 proteins, we find roughly 200 that are most likely brain derived. And most of these are synaptic proteins. And so you can start now and, and they're probably in exosomes, you know, how do they get to the right. blood? Probably through exosomes. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so what I keep telling people is the fact that you find something in the blood doesn't mean it's, you know, from dead cells or leftover stuff, yeah. but it's actually part of a physiological process that cells use, as you say, to release little sort of, pieces of themselves constantly and maybe they serve to communicate with other cells with other tissues even um, and they contain information about the physiological state of that cell yeah so my vision is sort of that we can use this to learn in the blood about the function of the brain you know about different cell types and about their physiological state by simply sampling these you know liquid biopsies you can call them but extend this to the brain right so that yeah. we can understand how the brain works in a living person by looking at these 
proteins that somehow end up in the blood, but they're originally from the brain. Have you done the experiment though of, of isolating these exosomes from young blood and then, yeah, just injecting yeah. the exosome? Yeah, we, have, we haven't done that. We, we tried it a few years ago, but the tools to purify the exosomes were not good enough. And we haven't, well, uh, we haven't come back. You, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and we did it with centrifugation and it, it was not pure enough and, and yeah. That's still not reproducible problem, enough. Yeah. So I think as the tools get better, that one could uh, probably do that. But again, we take sort of more this... Um, simplistic approach to try to see whether the proteins that we can measure and where we have high confidence that they come from the brain yeah. can we um we have now thousands of individuals from alzheimer's centers here at stanford or with carlos cruciaga at washu where we have you know measured five thousand to seven thousand proteins in plasma from these people we have longitudinal collection we know their cognitive function and so we can calculate the relative age of the brain of a person based on the composition of uh, the plasma proteins from the brain and then this brain age is actually a good prediction predictor of function and of mm. cognitive decline mm. <laughs> That and, is fascinating. Yeah, it is. It's very fascinating. Uh, very exciting times. Uh, thanks for taking the time, Tony. Uh, I appreciate it. And yeah. uh, keep up the good work. Uh, I'll try to keep in touch. You know, I retired like it's been almost four years ago now from the NIA. So yeah. I wrote a couple books and then I'm yeah. doing, this, doing these podcasts Yeah, for two reasons. There's actually... Nowhere I know of where there's a collection of conversations with neuroscientists like at the cutting edge of their field in one place and that are at a level that it's, it's kind of borderline between, you know, the average layman who doesn't have a scientific mm -hmm. background understanding and then, but going beyond that. Mm -hmm you know, getting into a little more of the science that, say, mm -hmm. most people who have some biology or mm -hmm. chemistry background yeah. can understand. So, Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, no, thanks for doing that. So how, how has it been for you to, to be well, retired? So the, you, you seem it, to be very busy. I'm busy in the mornings. Yeah. I goof off, except now is unusual, actually. Usually I goof yeah. off in the afternoon. Yeah. But, um, yeah. So I write and read in the morning. I'm doing this, you know, one kind of be a resource, but other, for my own personal benefit, I get to, it It kind of encourages me to read up and keep up what's going mm -hmm. on in all yeah. different areas of neuroscience. Yeah, yeah. And, and I don't have to worry about, I don't have to worry about grants or, yeah. you know. Um, Peer review. <laughs> or, you know, someone had an accident in the lab or, you know, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Peer true. review. Yeah, I'm not not uh -huh. reviewing journal articles anymore. Or grants. Uh -huh. so, yeah, yeah. That's okay. great. Yeah. yeah, good talking to you. Thanks. It was it was fun. Likewise. Take care, Tony. Yeah. You too. Bye. Bye.